Good morning, everyone. George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to the Wine Industry Leadership Conference. We've got a pretty special day today. We've got three sessions. We're going to be taking a look at succession planning from two perspectives. From the perspective of those winery owners that are looking to transition their winery to the next generation and get some advice on things that they can do to make that, that transition a little bit easier uh, and hopefully a little bit uh, less costly. Uh, but we're also going to be looking at from the other perspective for those winery owners that are, that are planning on selling their winery. And the things that they can do now to not only maximize profitability but minimize taxes, and some of the other you know some of the other things that they can do to just make the most of that opportunity. The second session of the day is we're going to be looking at retaining talent. One of the things that we all saw a tremendous amount of during the pandemic is is staff moving from here to there, and one of the biggest concerns, whether you're a, a huge wine company or a small mom and pop is keeping that great team intact. So we've got a great panel assembled, give you some advice on things that you can do other than just pay more money, right? Because that's not always an option. So I think this particular session is relevant for wineries of all sizes. And the third session today is we're gonna be taking an economic look at our industry from two perspectives, macro, big picture, what's happening out there and what are some of those indicators telling us we might expect over the next you know, 12 to 18 months, 24 months. And then we're gonna drill down and take a look at the wine industry you know, very specifically. And that particular part of the session is gonna be led by Mike Bisa. Uh, most of you know Mike as the wine economist. Uh, he's an author, he's a public speaker, he does a great job. We are super thrilled to have Mike with us today. But to open things up, we've got Dr. Robert Eiler. We've worked with Dr. Eiler before, professor of economics at Sonoma State. Rob does also does an awful lot of, uh, of public speaking and just has a real knack for making things that appear complicated, a little bit less complicated, a little more digestible. So we're, we're very excited to have Rob with us again today. Now, before we get started, we would not be able to offer these conferences for free without the support of our sponsors. So we've got three great sponsors that I have to thank. Turrentine Wine Brokerage, who we worked with for more than 10 years, outstanding company. We've got Comcast Business. Comcast is serving many of the wine industry, you know, the wineries out there as well as well as wine industry vendors. We were actually using, we use Comcast here as well. Uh, the service is terrific. And then finally, California Payroll Service. California Payroll has been in business and service in California businesses for over 18 years. So three great companies. Thank you so much for, for your support and for allowing us to be able to offer this free to the industry. Now, before we get started, as is always the case, our goal is to make these sessions as interactive as possible. And uh, and to that end, we, we always pre-record a couple of days in advance. Now, we, we obviously do it for quality purposes. We want to make sure we deliver, deliver a quality product, but it also allows us to have a whole session of basically Q&A uh, versus the, you know, what we are become you know, accustomed to, which is 45 minutes of presentation and five to 10 minutes of Q&A. This way you can you know, ask questions as they come to you. Uh, in this particular case, both Rob and Mike are watching the broadcast just like you are. They're ready to take your questions as they come to you. So please take advantage of the chat feature and, uh, and submit those questions. All right, I think, that's, uh, I think that about covers it. Again, thank you to the sponsors. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rob Eiler to the stage. Rob, welcome and thank you. This session is sponsored by Comcast Business, powering possibilities. And Turntine Brokerage, supporting growers and wineries since 1973 by providing the best data-driven analysis to create profitable supply strategies and opportunities. Rob, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot, George, I appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. Uh, Obviously, a lot of unpredictability out there. I think if there's one thing that we've gotten accustomed to is that trying to predict anything is oftentimes, at least lately, feels like an exercise in futility. But there still are those economic indicators out there. They still do tell a story. And I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thanks a lot, George. Yeah, it's been a pretty volatile time. And I think there's a lot of good information, misinformation, a lot of fogginess out there. So I'll try to move us through all that and give you what I think is kind of the best way of thinking about the economic data you may hear and also thinking about the next couple of years and what we may see. Well, great. Well, I'm going to let you take it from here. And uh, thanks again for being with us. 
You bet. Thank you. So folks, what I want to do today is I want to move you through what economists are seeing over the next few years and, and do it in the three major parts. One is to talk about the national economy, some changes at the state economy, and then think about how those translate to what might happen in the wine industry over the next couple of years and then hand it off to Mike. So these data here are from November 2021. New data come out a little later in February that are a quarterly forecast that comes from the Philadelphia Federal Reserve. And it is, in essence, the cornerstone of the forecast that uh, moves in front of the Federal Reserve when they make interest rate decisions. And I'm showing you just three variables from that forecast. The first one is called real GDP and is really income after inflation, thinking about the purchasing power growth of income in a percentage sense every year. The unemployment rate, which is the percentage of the labor force that is not working, but is supposedly actively seeking work. And then what is kind of a fancy way of thinking about inflation, which is called core PCE. And what that really is, is it's a way economists measure the inflation of the cost of buying the broadest base basket, if you will, or, or set of goods and services that households buy. But core means we've stripped out food and energy prices because they tend to be historically more volatile than other industries. But when you take those three together, it gives you at least a sense of where policymakers are looking and really where you should be thinking about when you hear about economic news with respect to what might happen over the next few quarters and years. So this is the latest forecast, again, as of November 2021. But two aspects of this is, one, you'll see that the growth rate of real income or income after inflation is slowly drifting down to kind of what we think of as a stable point. And we were more or less about five or sorry, about half a percentage point away from that 3.1% right before the pandemic hit. And that in a sense, 2.5 to 3% was sort of pre-pandemic normal. And so we're getting there basically by the end of this year in terms of this forecast. But that shaded area, because it's the last forecast we have, is juxtaposed to the non-shaded area to its left, which is the previous quarter's forecast. So another little piece of this is to notice that each one of those numbers until the third quarter of 2022 is down from the previous quarter's forecast. And a lot of that is wrapped around two items. Is one, the emergence of the Omicron variant, which slowed down economic activity globally here and there, and put a little bit more fogginess in the forecast going forward. And also that the fiscal package that we called the Build Back Better bill did not quite make it. So originally in late summer and early fall, we expected there to be two major spending packages on top of the federal budget. One was the investment, or sorry, the Infrastructure Investment Act, which did pass. But then the second one was this bigger, larger, broad-based bill that was called Build Back Better. Didn't make it. So that downgraded some of those forecasts in terms of the amount of income we would generate as an economy. However, it didn't really do much in terms of changing the employment outlook with respect to just specifically the unemployment rate. And you can see that's drifting down to right around 4% by the end of the year. And in fact, we still keep beating this forecast. So if you look at the latest numbers coming out of the US at the national level, we're actually, these forecasts are uh, not really showing what's going on in actuality. We're actually beating these and we're actually right around 4% already, which is great news on the one hand. One caveat to that, and this is something I'll talk about later when we talk about California's economy, is how much of this is driven by the removal of people from the labor force, which is the denominator in this ratio called the unemployment rate. If you remove basically folks who would have been unemployed otherwise, you shrink the unemployment level at the same time you're shrinking the labor force. And that ratio likes to shrink more quickly under those conditions. So how much of that reduction in the unemployment rate is really because people are getting a job or is because people are no longer really looking for work and hence are not counted as much. So there's a lot of hand waving about how we should look at unemployment, but it is something that at least at the wine industry level, there will be decisions made about labor force based on some of these macro variables and the unemployment rate is an easy one to understand. And so sometimes you might say, well, we might have more trouble hiring if the unemployment rate is shrinking lower and lower volume. So should we really hire this year? And even a delay of five or six months can ripple out into other parts of the wine industry and the associated industries over the next couple of years. The next stop, which is maybe the largest piece of macroeconomic news over the last six or eight months is what's going on with inflation. So most economists believe that 2022 will be a year of transition for inflation. And you can see over the next few quarters, the uh, the current forecast is elevated from last quarter's forecast, but it's slowly drifting down rather than continuing to rise up. Now, I'm going to show you some data that are the latest data 
And then this forecast kind of recast over the next few years, which is the last little shaded area I'll show you on this slide. But the idea is notice it's drift down suggests that while it is higher than we thought it was gonna be just a couple quarters ago, we are expecting there to be some reduction in inflation pressure over this year. And as you'll see in a minute, over the next few years, so much of that depends on how we bring the supply side of our economy globally back to something that looks a little bit more like where we were pre-pandemic. So not only did we have the Delta variant upset supply chains, we already had upset in supply chains going into 2021. 2021 was a wild year for supply chains and just sort of getting back together after a major recession, continued issues with the variants. And then we got hit again at the end of this year. And a lot of that's also being driven by demand side inflation. And in a little bit, I'll try to parse out how economists are looking at this, but I can tell you right now, it's a little bit of inside baseball. Economists do not do a great job in, in discovering how much of it is supply side driven. We think we're pretty good on the demand side. The supply side is something that really doesn't happen that often. And when it does, it kind of baffles economists in terms of looking at the data and parsing out which one is which. And that's why it's important to parse out whether it's supply driven or demand driven or what mix it is, is because policymakers, when they think about increasing interest rates, for example, the Federal Reserve, to try to reduce inflation pressure, if most of it's supply side driven, you don't really use policy to do anything about that. It makes, in fact, can exacerbate the inflation pressure if you increase interest rates and most of it is supply side driven in terms of prices that you're trying to control with rising interest rates. From a GDP standpoint after inflation, the next few years look pretty good. So while we're descending in growth rate, we're actually still very robust over the next couple of years and then kind of getting the pre-pandemic normals the unemployment rate, a lot of this is hand waving. We're already beating these numbers, as I said before, but the idea is that we're kind of going to drift down to what you could call the beginnings of full employment. So much of that depends on where our labor force participation rate is and how much we've lost in terms of workers with respect to people that have walked away for multiple reasons. Again, I'll, I'll provide a little bit more detail on that when we talk about California in just a minute. And then inflation, as I said before, is drifting down to something that looks a little bit higher than we were before the pandemic. But what you could think of as kind of a, a typical inflation rate for the United States. So when you add all this up, just a couple of things about the American economy forecast. While there are some headwinds and inflation is higher than we thought it would be, generally speaking, these numbers are very robust. So as we go in through 2022 and into 2023, the context around the wine industry, thinking of the American economy as one bellwether statistic that you want to watch or a set of statistics you want to watch with, with respect to where the in the uh, industry is going economically, things look pretty good. On the recovery side of jobs, I want to show you this relatively quickly. Economists tend to want to compare current recessions and recovery to previous ones. And the best one is the Great Recession, the one we went through at the end of the initial decade of this new millennium. That's what it looked like in terms of jobs recovery. So from November 2007, which is at 100, that was the beginning of the Great Recession. It took about 78 months to get all those jobs back after we had the initial job losses from the recession. For this recession and recovery period, we're as of December 2021, just under 98% back to where we were right before the recession began. So notice that while there was this hard cut in 2020, basically April and May, we had a sharp uptick and then some flattening. And a lot of that flattening is classic. And you can see that sort of flat, slow movement toward the red dotted line at the far right hand side with respect to what happened in the Great Recession, basically from like month 55 to month 78. We're now in that mode. And it might take another seven or eight months for actually us to get those jobs back. And that's why that unemployment rate I just showed you is so deceiving. Because the unemployment rate might be back down to where we were pre-pandemic. But if we got to get, this is a reflection on the number of people working in the United States. And so we're only 98% back to where we started right before the recession. We need to get that black line over that red dotted line to feel like we've actually got everybody back to work in terms of total employment. Now, why that's also tricky is that we probably have seen a lot of shifts within the American economy away from certain industries that still have damage towards ones that recovered more quickly. So if you break that down, this is the original changes within the American economy just as the recession began. This is April 2020 compared to January 2020, right before the recession, where we started to seize up labor markets. And here's May. So like I just showed you, there was initial cuts in April and May. Almost every single sector of the American economy was affected. 
Now, by the end of December 2020, we saw some recovery. By the end of last year, and this is through December 2021, we saw recovery across a lot of industries, but there's a couple of standouts. One is accommodation, which is hotel, motel, B&Bs, places you stay overnight. And the other one, which is oh, ha definitely had some recovery as our economy opened up and is still down about 5%, is food services and drinking places, basically bars, restaurants, or anywhere they serve food as a, as a commercial business. You take those two together and think, okay, how dependent is the wine industry on those industries? Well, if you are a winery in California who wants foot flow through a tasting room, you want people to visit that area, stay overnight, and spend a lot of money while they're there, especially coming to tasting rooms. When accommodations are down, so is local bar and restaurant activity. So, are tasting, so is tasting room activity, which can also change the way you're selling wine in terms of your total inventory and how you're pushing for full retail. So one of the things we have to do, and I'll come back and talk about this in just a minute as well, is we need to get people back traveling and wanting to spend money when they travel and specifically coming to wine country throughout the United States, specifically in California. Let's break down inflation a little bit. So this is the evolution of that core PCE index I talked about before with respect to the, the forecast over the next couple of quarters in the next few years. These are those data on a monthly basis from 2007 forward to November 2021. And then those red dots are forecasts. Now I'm going to show you that in a shaded area. So this is basically what we just saw, but now with a little bit more historic context about where we've been. So why are people so riled up about what's been going on with inflation? It's two items. Is one, we've had very steady, slow moving, predictable inflation for 25 years, and really most specifically after the Great Recession, we had a nice bout of relatively easy, slow moving, low inflation, historically speaking. You can see how that's been below that blue dotted line. And the Federal Reserve basically wants inflation to be around that dotted line. If it's too low, that's problematic for businesses. If it's too high, it's problematic for customers. So when it spikes like this, it's generally bad for everybody. Doesn't mean that it's it's not bad for businesses. I mean, it's great for business. It would for businesses, they can actually change their prices a little bit and keep up. And when it rises like this quickly, it can suppress consumption in such a way that you sure you can raise your price, but maybe nobody's going to buy anything. So we don't like spiking inflation. It rising a little bit's okay. When it's moving like this, it just creates a lot of uncertainty. So the belief is, and this is the trick in it all is that after this year, we will clean up a lot of the supply chain issues we've been facing as, as the global economy is recovering from COVID and all of its variants and all of its effects on production, distribution, and ultimately moving toward retail and beyond. It will turn that corner and those red dots are showing you it's drifting down to what we saw on that first slide. Now, the issue with that is we want to say, okay, well, what's really driving this situation and what's going to allow us to make that corner get or get that corner turned and kind of drift down to something that's around 2.1%. A lot of it is whether or not we actually see prices starting to stabilize because it's really about driving expectations. If I believe inflation is going to rise, this is kind of classic econ. If I think that inflation is going to rise, it might trigger my belief that if I don't buy now, it's going to cost more later. So I buy now and it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one of the Real tricks in policy making is how do I shape and what we call anchor expectations in such a way that I look at short term volatility in prices is not that big a deal. Well, the only way that those that volatility in prices looks short term is if I actually start to observe prices falling or stabilizing rather than consistently drifting up. So we will see if we start to see that, and I'm, that really at the grocery store where most of that reflection happens with consumers. Are our ports clearing? So a huge sort of story there for two or three months was we had all these ships backed up on the West Coast of the United States waiting to unload goods and we had goods stacking up. Are the ports clearing to suggest that that's not holding up goods getting to market, creating shortages, and thus again, should have some power on stabilizing prices from rising otherwise. If the Federal Reserve increases rates quickly, then they believe inflation is a bigger problem than maybe we thought initially. And so we're watching very closely what rhetoric is coming out of the Federal Reserve about rate changes. Interest rates rising should suppress business and consumer spending in such a way to say, okay, we know you still have incentives to spend, but what we're trying to do is fine tune that set of incentives in such a way to not create more demand side pressure. And as I said off the top, inflation has both a supply and a demand side to it. 
And everywhere inflation happens when you have excess demand in markets. So if supply is contracting at the same time that we want to buy more stuff, that difference creates inflation pressure. So if you can increase interest rates and push the demand side down a little bit at the same time that supply is opening back up again and meet the two in the middle, you get this drift down. And for right now, that is the expectation. And that's why this forecast looks the way it does more or less. Now, how much the Federal Reserve and how quick the we're going to react to what they're reading in the data is a big unknown, and that can affect our equity markets. Will wages, will, sorry, will wages continue to rise? So we've seen wages rising. I'll show you a graph on this in just a minute for California. But if wages continue to rise, it puts more business cost pressure on these prices where businesses want to transmit those changes in labor costs onto consumers. So we'll see if wages still continue to rise as we're still struggling to find workers. How many workers have actually left? So wages might be rising, not because people don't want to come back to work, but because they're, they've retired and have no intention of coming back. They basically remove themselves. So rather than saying, I have to stay home a little while to stay with my kids, but as soon as I'm ready to go, I'm going back in the labor force. We may have a bunch of people who've removed themselves once and for all. So one of the things economists are trying to figure out from the data, and it usually takes us about a year to figure this out, is when you have a lot of volatility in labor markets, how much of it is short-term versus medium-term in terms of changing the structure of who's available for work. And with our borders somewhat closed through both a combination of immigration policy and also travel policy around the, uh, the variants and around COVID-19 in general, that changes their available labor from global sources, and that can create further shortages in labor markets. How much higher will housing prices go? So one of the also, also pieces, I'm sorry, another piece of what happens in inflation, especially at the local level, is that local housing prices tend to make certain places more expensive than others. So around the United States, we've seen housing prices rise. Very few communities have not seen housing prices rise over the last 12 or 18 months. But how much higher they go will also transmit effects into this inflation rate. So if they are still going up because we're not building houses fast enough against demand, this will put more pressure on it. And again, the key is trying to decompose the supply from the demand side. If we can't do that well, we can't run policy well, and that means it creates more uncertainty for businesses, and that can slow down overall economic activity because we just don't know enough to make the right decision. So what we do is we get into a, situ a situation of stasis, and that's not good for economies. So this inflation issue is something to watch. We predict right now it's going to turn the corner. We'll see. I wanted to show you this. This is the evolution of the dollar to the euro. And so for the last few years, it's been relatively stable. And now it's turning back down again, meaning the dollar is getting slightly stronger against the euro. And you can see most of what's happened in 2021 in that circle. But why this is important is if you think about competition in the wine industry, will you see, once we have a little bit more cleanup of our supply chains, more wine moving? from France and Italy toward the United States if the American consumer wants more wine. We'll see if that's true, especially if the dollar is getting stronger. Now, we know we've had some supply issues in France and also to a certain extent in Italy. It doesn't mean there's not inventory on the sidelines somewhere. It's just really a key is whether or not this change in the currency will trigger even more demand and provide more competition. So we'll see how that goes over the next couple of years. But I always kind of watch with, with respect to the wine industry, What's going on with exchange rates? Because it is something that can jump in and create more competition, almost, I wouldn't say artificially, but something that just puts another vector out there with respect to uncertainty about what might be coming for our wineries here in the United States. If you look at the job market in California, and this is the same graph we looked at for the US above, it took California about 72 months to go from the beginning of the Great Recession to its end. But we've recovered a little bit more slowly in this recession than the US has overall. And that was also true in the Great Recession. And then once California took off, it really took off more quickly. We're about 95.2%. And this is actually uh, data that are not from December 2020, but from November 2021. Sorry about that mislabeling. The idea here is we still got a little way to go to get that black line above the red dotted line in California. So much of that is because we shut down more of our economy and kept it shut down in California before the US started to open up. That's a critical factor in terms of how California might fully emerge from this, uh, from this crisis. And we're watching closely to see what happens to the evolution of workforce in California. I'll talk about that in the very last slide in just a minute. Here is a forecast 
of where we have been. I'm sorry, that's not a forecast of where we've been, but where we've been and the forecast of where we're going over the next few years to the end of 2025. So with the governor's budget that just came out uh, last Monday on January 10th, the Department of Finance of California also provides an employment forecast and a bunch of other things. I'm gonna show you a wage forecast in just a minute. To think about what's gonna happen with jobs and how that might lead to personal income growth and then ultimately growth in tax revenue for California. But this is where Department of Finance in California sees the evolution of jobs. Now, why that's important is this red dotted line is where we started right before the recession. So in terms of where California's recovery may take place completely, they're predicting by the end of this year that black line we saw in the last graph will cross the red dotted line in that graph, meaning we will recover. That's what's going on here. So if you connect those dots, what we just saw, this is its evolution to 2025. So we cross at the end of this year, and then we see some expansion over the next few years. So while we hear a lot about people leaving California, trickiness with workforce, economists in California believe that we will see people come back to work, especially as the final variants in this current round of COVID-19 play through the economy, as long as employers still want to hire, and we have the economic forecast generally, meaning that people want to consume and businesses also want to consume. That will keep everything going in the economy in terms of playing out with the forecasts and workers will continue to have demand for their time. That transition point is key. Last year, the budget forecast for the exact same time, but 12 months ago, showed that black line crossing the red line two years later than this forecast does. So things have gotten appreciably better in the California economy in 12 months time. And that's good. It's still not as good as the US overall, but history suggests we will catch up. And so that's what it looks like for the rest of the half of this decade. Wages, however, have had a little bit faster recovery. Same timeline, quarterly data, 2005 forward. There is the Great Recession. Here is the very simple COVID-19 recession. And this is really the only transition we saw with respect to wages. There was an initial cut, and then wages bounced right back up. Why? The recovery was relatively quick initially. Employers wanted to bring workers back to work and wages climbed up because people chose not to come back for a multitude of reasons and to draw them back on, for example, because unemployment benefits were also available in an augmented and extended fashion. You had employers competing with those benefits to try to bring people back more quickly. And so you see that real, very much a V-shaped recovery there in wages and then rising up very quickly. Now, actually, inflation adjusted these wages. So this is purchasing power of wages, not just how much you're getting in your paycheck, but what does it really buy you historically? You can see over the last decade, real wages, while you know some bumps and clucks here or there, in trend, it did pretty good. But you can see here where things were, and then right up the ladder, uh, we, we look to be going. So will wages be rising over the next few three or four years? The answer is, it looks like it should be. But think again, why? If inflation in consumer markets is a function of excess demand, meaning that if demand exceeds supply, we should expect prices to rise, wages rising suggests that demand for workers is going to exceed their supply in California. So while we see jobs going up, if the supply is relatively limited, wages are going to have to go up to follow, or you will not attract the right number of workers. And it may not be, a, you may not be able to attract them anyway. And that's what's so critical about these forecasts. If you take the two together, the wages and the jobs growth, we would be able to find the workers. So if you think about from a wine industry standpoint, you think about what happens in the vineyard, what happens in the winery, what happens in distribution, what happens in retail, that full supply chain of our three-tier system, where are the pockets going to be most problematic? And if you think about what happens in agriculture and then ultimately inside the winery, that's probably least or less concerning than what happens in distribution because we've seen so much shift toward distribution Will there be workers that aren't, don't have a job already that are going to be able to fulfill the distribution needs? That's where I think most of the action is going to happen in terms of really job concerns. It's going to be the distribution portion of the supply chain. But we will see how the next few years go. This is one vision of what might happen to the cost of labor. Okay. I want to show you a couple of last items here as we wrap up. This is occupancy rates throughout California in different places with respect to travel. So one of the biggest pieces of generating full retail for wineries is actually getting people to come to the winery and spend and also get in wine clubs and sort of really capture people by the story of the winery. 
This is the evolution in Napa County. So Napa County has actually seen a lot of good recovery in terms of people staying overnight again in 2021. We need to keep that momentum going in 2022. Now I'm gonna quickly move through other places until we get to San Francisco. This is Palm Springs. This is Monterey County. Notice a lot of this is drifting along similar to Napa County because as people went out, they kind of went all, all over the place. Uh, Palm Springs, not as much in 2021 as we saw in 2020. Sonoma County, very similar to Napa. South Lake Tahoe drifting a little bit down as the year ended. Marin County, which is between Sonoma, Napa, and San Francisco, and kind of gets a lot of flow and gets some overflow from those areas. But this is San Francisco. So if you think about wine country and what is gained access to indirectly from people coming to San Francisco, this is a concerning headwind. We need people to be coming back to California generally to visit wineries in California if we want to get people to come back to the levels they were at pre-pandemic. And if people are not coming to San Francisco, it's very tough to market to that sort of additional audience that is coming globally to the Bay Area to grab onto that revenue while they're in the Bay Area. So you can see that that's what's been happening toward the end of 2021 as things are drifting down, but they're drifting down from relatively good highs, except for San Francisco throughout California as 2021 ended. Now, this is a forecast that comes out of tourism economics and it's done for the state of California. And while this looks like just a massive data, I wanna focus on a couple of items here. This is the domestic level of spending that was there in billions of dollars for California 2019. Now, if you look at that line, that, that bolded line that says domestic and where that oval is highlighted and move to your right, notice the hard sh shock in 2020, almost half of it gone, you can see that a little bit more than half, 54.4% down, but then slowly rising in 2021 and on up. But then I have that other oval shaded area, 116.3 in 2024. So most economists believe that we will not see travel come back in California where it was pre-pandemic in terms of total spending before 2024. It might be 2023, depending on how the 2022 travel season goes and our ability to kind of completely turn the corner and then 2023 will be an expansion year and up the ladder will go. But that's a long period of time to have less than expected travel. And then the wine industry is kind of in those concentric circles around the travel industry, again, especially in wine country around California. It kind of is part of the array of spending that happens when people come to California. It's a reason why people come to California, but if people aren't coming to California, period, in terms of what they're spending when they, when they do come here, it's going to reduce what's spent in wine country. Now, on the international side, which is really another big audience, you can see here's 28.1 and whoop, here's 28.1 and two. So next bolded line down, it might be an extra year before the international crowd comes back. So that first line is just domestic travel. The second line is international. We need those travelers to come back to really gain access to those additional pieces of spending and revenue in this industry, or it's going to be a little bit longer time to get that revenue back. That's, again, just frosting. The other piece of that, it acts like indirect marketing. So those travelers really do a good job of seeing the wine industry for a bigger thing when they come to our wineries. A challenge for employers going forward in California is going to be demographic change. These data just came out in December. So this is the evolution of the California population over the last basically 20 fiscal years in California. This is births, here's deaths, and that difference is what we call kind of cold-bloodedly the natural increase in the population. So California generally, especially over the last 50, 60 years, has been a place where we've seen a lot of families grow up. We've seen population rise very quickly. A lot of it because we've seen more kids born than people passing on. We've also had a lot of foreign inbound immigrants. So this green columns add to the population because people are coming from other places. The last stop is domestic migration. So we have foreign immigration, which is historically in California been net inbound, but the purple columns at the bottom, but only in year 2000, we see it actually pick up, is the net movement of people to and from California, from other parts of the United States. So notice from almost the last two, two decades, the net, while we know people have come and gone from California, the net has been to go away. 
So what was stabilizing the California population or allowing it to grow was that we got more people coming in, babies and people from outside the country than people leaving. And that now has shifted. So the, the pandemic added this shock to domestic migration. You see how large that purple column is at the very far right-hand side, which then created for the first time in recorded time in terms of watching all these components of population an actual estimated decrease in the state population. Now, why that's important is that we believe that a lot of people that have left California are of prime working age. And if that's true, that's another reason why we might have trouble in the short to medium term with respect to hiring in California. So watch for more details on the demography of the population in California with respect to how many people are here and able to work. You add all that up. Are there some headwinds for the wine industry? Yes. Available labor, the cost of doing business, shipping costs as well, right? If you're shipping and you're, you've gone to a model that looks like DTC more completely, shipping costs have been a nightmare. That competition in inventory globally, watch for that over the next few years. We've spent some relief in harvest, but it doesn't mean there's not inventory sitting on the sidelines for the short term while they blow out that inventory. Watch for that. The regulations about where you can send wine the, the tariff structures, the subsidy structures in other countries, where is that going to go? But really, a lot of the issues are here in, in the United States. We're watching closely to see if there's any more court cases about how easy or hard it is to move wine around the United States. And it could be the last couple of years that people are a little burned out and they've built their libraries up. So how much more can you sell on the DTC side? There has to be a headwind coming there some, some point. But there's also some tailwinds. Almost everything I told you is more or less a good story about the economic recovery continuing. There is a good model going on with DTC. And if you can maintain margins within that portal, DTC might be now finally the wave of the future once and for all. And if travel comes back, there's a lot of pent up demand there. So watch for your tasting rooms and getting ready to hire because if 2022 is a strong travel season, there's gonna be a lot of people coming through California wine country. And that rising demand to go back to eat out at, at restaurants, if that rises, that's going to maybe be a slow reversal of that distribution shift we saw in 2020 and in 2021 of a reduction in orders from restaurants now suddenly rising back up. But a lot of that depends on travel demand. So even if we as Californians go back out and want to eat more often, we still need a lot of extra revenue coming in to help subsidize all those restaurants and all those wine sales on on-premise sales in our supply chains. So with that, I'll hand it back over to George. Thanks again, folks, for having me. And if you have any questions that we don't get to or any other, anything else, just find me at those addresses and I'll take care of you. Thanks. Rob, really fascinating. Uh, a lot to think about. I, I love the way you framed it up at the end with looking at the headwinds and the tailwinds. And uh, fingers crossed, uh, some of those indicators uh, come to fruition. Uh, especially as regarding with regard to the the economic recovery, and um, we started heading back to where we once were. But uh, thanks again for all your time. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. That was great. Next, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive directly into our industry. I'd like to introduce Mike Viseth. Mike is the editor of the Wine Economist, uh, author of many books. He's also the professor emeritus of the International Political Economy at the University of Puget Sound. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Well, we uh, appreciate you taking some time to be with us today. Um, pretty exciting times, uh, if nothing else, certainly unpredictable. Uh, so very much looking forward to, uh, to what you have to uh, present today. All right, well, thank you, and thank you. And I'll, uh, I may make some predictions, but I want everybody to know that the reason that economists make predictions isn't because we know, it's because we get asked for them so much. So let me share my screen. I have a brief presentation for you. So um, is this how you feel today? Is this how 2022 is making you feel? Just a little squeezed? Or maybe you're a little more squeezed? Well, that's the, um, that's the theme that, of my presentation today. As we've just seen with the, um, the previous discussion about the economy, there are a lot of changes going on, a lot of forces at work, a lot of things to be concerned about. And when we're looking at the wine industry, well, um, I decided that perhaps 
the theme to use to pull many of those factors together is wine and the big squeeze. Um, the uh, uh, forces that are squeezing our margins, the, uh, the problems we have to try to deal with it, maybe some strategies to work our way through this. So wine and the big squeeze. But as, as George says, I want to start by sort of uh, confessing that I have a split personality. If you uh, go to Amazon.com and you type in my given name, Michael V. Seth, well, then you'll get um, books like uh, Mountains of Debt and Global Oni and Global Oni 2 and uh, four different series of university textbooks because that's the professor name, Michael V. Seth at the University of Puget Sound. And, um, and that's how I have spent one half of my career uh, looking at the issues of the global economy, the issues like you've already heard about for today. Uh, if you, on the other hand, go to um, amazon.com and you type Mike V. Seth, well, then you get books about the wine business. Uh, books like my 2011 book, Wine Wars, or Extreme Wine, Money, Taste, and Wine, my most recent book, Around the World in 80 Wines, and a book that's coming out in July of 2022, Wine Wars 2, an update of Wine Wars to look at how things have changed. Uh, the story about how my personality got so split is um, when I wrote Global Oni, Global Oni was a series of case studies of how globalization plays out in different industries. And one of the industries that I examined was the wine industry. And I found it just so darn interesting that everything I knew about the economy, everything I knew about economic forces somehow showed up in the wine business. And so I decided I would try to learn more. And I could have stayed in the professor side of the of a lane of the freeway and uh, attended academic conferences and talked to other professors. But I decided instead that what I wanted to do was to um, uh, interact with people in the business. I wanted to talk about the people who made wine and sold wine and financed the wine business and so forth. So I started the newsletter, thewineeconomist.com uh, because on the internet, well, you know, you can have these sorts of conversations and I kind of, transition from Michael V. Seth to Mike V. Seth, because with a little focus group uh, study, I discovered that it, Michael V. Seth didn't get quite as many uh, replies and comments and reactions as Mike V. Seth. People weren't afraid to talk about wine business with Mike V. Seth. And as you can see, it has sort of uh, spawned a number of books. And now, uh, before the pandemic, at least, uh, uh, I traveled the world speaking to wine industry conferences, which has been so very, so very interesting for me. Um, the uh, big squeeze that you're facing, well, you probably feel a little like this basket press. I'm going to illustrate some of my slides uh, sort of humorously with different elements, different ways of thinking about the big squeeze. And this is an Australian uh, Shiraz from Evans and Tate, the big squeeze. Uh, we know from uh, uh, the previous presenter about the uh, problems that we're facing around the economy. Inflation has become uh, public enemy number one from an economic standpoint, for example, as we've just had the highest uh, annual inflation rates in 40 years, oh my goodness. And so the uh, higher inflation rates are causing rising costs in all sorts of places. Um, part of it is because of the bottlenecks that we've had in the economy. The, uh, you all know about the uh, bottlenecks in making uh, microchips, which is why it's so difficult to buy a new car and why new car prices and used car prices are all going through the roof. Um, the bottleneck economy affects a lot of different things. One of the things that affects, of course, most directly is uh, international shipping. Uh, that the uh, over the 40 years, 30 years at least, the wine business has grown into a kind of a remarkable globally integrated business um, where uh, wine is shipped all around the world, bottles are shipped all around the world, uh, bulk wine goes here and there. It's uh, just amazing. And of course, the, um, uh, the bottlenecks in the shipping economy uh, affect 
lots of different sectors, but also affects uh, the ship of the, the wine sector. Um, the rising costs that come from that is really quite dramatic. The Economist newspaper, a British publication, uh, was trying to, to get a sense of how the, the uh, rising shipping costs, when you can get a container of the Trans-Pacific uh, shipping, uh, how much that has been. And it's kind of interesting. They, uh, uh, the um, value of the goods that go into a container varies, of course. If it's all full of microchips, then the value is very high. If it's all full of uh, cheap uh, patio furniture, the value is not so high. But they figure, imagine on average that it's $50,000 worth of product that goes into a container. Well, before the pandemic and before the bottlenecks, the Trans-Pacific shipping cost was about $1,500. So $1,500 out of $50,000, that shipping wasn't a significant factor, not, uh, not a very significant factor. Well, so what's happened is that the cost of that container, if you can get the container and if you can get it unloaded and brought to where you, has gone from about $1,500 to $15,000 or even $20,000 if you're having to buy the container space on the spot market is as many people have to do. Well, uh, $20,000 on a, on a 15, on a $50,000 container. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's like taxation. That's prohibitive taxation that has the same sort of effect. And so the bottleneck economy has pushed up costs for shipping, created uncertainty for shipping, pushed up costs uh, throughout, the, throughout the economy and wine is no different. One of the effects of the, of the uncertainty that we have from the shipping is uh, a change in mindset, a change in the way that we think about doing our business. Uh, the, we learned from the uh, Japanese car producers about just-in-time production where you, had, you minimize the expensive inventories because the inputs to your process arrive just in time, just in time for you to use them to make your product. Now we've moved into a, a model where it's really just in case, where you, you order too much, more than you think you will need because it might not come at all and you might not know when it comes. And so, so suddenly um, uh, warehouse space is uh, at a premium. The cost of that is rising as well. And, the uh, ability to easily uh, transition, to easily increase the scale of production or alter things is very difficult. Uh, uh, the uh, effects have been dramatic. Um, uh, in uh, Argentina, for example, I understand that some producers can't, haven't been able to bottle their wine because they haven't been able to get glass, uh, imported glass in order to do so. And so the bottleneck economy and rising costs uh, is a real cost push factor. Uh, labor costs have been rising as well. And the availability of labor, as you all have read about the, uh, um, the, the uh, huge number of uh, unfilled job openings throughout the economy. Uh, these things are very important. And so it's natural that um, we're given more thought to uh, what labor does in the wine industry. And we're, we're given more attention to um, attracting and especially to retaining the skilled labor. Uh, one thing that I've thought about is that if we were talking 10 years ago about labor costs and availability, well, we'd be talking about vineyard labor for the most part. And um, we'd be worried about immigration and, and the, the, those sorts of labor regulations. Uh, those things have not gone away, but now we're thinking about the marketing uh, professionals and administrative professionals. And really throughout, throughout the, the uh, production process of grapes and wine and much more attention has to be paid. This is now much more of a, uh, of a factor. And so rising costs throughout the supply chain and the rising costs put a squeeze on margins. Now, one of the, uh, uh, factors to, to bear in mind is that if those rising costs are squeezing you, well, it's squeezing throughout the product chain. Uh, it's uh, rising costs have squeezed uh, the grape growers, um, the people with the vineyards, and it squeezes the wineries, and it squeezes the distributors. And 
Uh, cost factors have been squeezing the retailers and restaurants and bars and so forth, that all of the, every part of the wine product chain now has been squeezed pretty hard. And so the, when one part gets squeezed, it puts more pressure on the others. Um, uh, as I say here, the pressure has to go somewhere. And like a toothpaste tube, the weakest point is the most vulnerable. And so um, the, uh, for example, retailers try to uh, push on consumers to get them to pay more, but they also try to push on um, distributors to cut their wholesale prices. And distributors try to push on the wineries to reduce their, their prices. And the wineries try to push on the, the growers to try to reduce their prices. And the squeeze works the other way. And so in different product segments, it must be said, the, uh, where the force is the biggest will be different. And in different product segments, um, how the, uh, uh, where the breaking point will be, where the vulnerable points will be, will be sort of different. And so uh, it's become a complicated uh, 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 power struggle, it seems to me, that uh, is likely to get worse before it gets better because the uh, factors that are pushing it, the inflation rate that is pushing up wages, the um, uh, squeeze on transportation and cost, other cost factors are unlikely to go away. And so naturally, as people begin to think about, well, how am I gonna deal with this? They turn to the idea of price. Well, no problem. We can just raise the price. We'll raise the price of the grapes. No problem, because then the wineries can raise the price of the wine. No problem, because then the distributors can raise the price, the wholesale price of the wines, and then the retailers can raise the price. And so no problem. In fact, and I've talked to people who kind of think along these lines, and, and maybe they're right, but their, their thought is that everybody knows that inflation is six, seven percent, maybe more in the future, maybe a little less. But everybody knows that inflation is going up. And so everyone knows that prices are rising. And so whereas four years ago, if you tried to raise price, they say, well, people would have gone, no, no, that's not going to happen. Now they think, well, maybe if you try to raise price, people will go, oh, well, man, everybody's raising price. I guess I'm going to have to pay more for it too. But the question is, can, can you really do that? Uh, or can you really do that in the um, in the wine market segment where you live? Can that really happen? Well, um, if you again, if you sort of look at uh, at evidence for things, there there is some sort of circumstantial, or maybe it's more than circumstantial evidence uh, that uh, uh, consumers might tolerate higher prices. Uh, as you know, we've been through this period of premiumization, where it seemed like uh, consumers have moved from uh, one price point to a higher price point to a higher price point. <clears throat> Just in the in the uh, 10 years between my books, Wine Wars and Wine Wars 2, the center of the wine market has uh, risen by, oh gosh, I think it's about 50%. The, the midpoint where you have half of the volume sold above and half the volume sold below has, uh, has migrated up uh, pretty substantially during that period of time. And then Again, if you're looking for evidence why you might be able to raise prices, then look at the sales data during the pandemic. Um, uh, if we look at where the growth in, in volumes has been the highest and the growth in value has been the highest, it hasn't been in the inexpensive wines, um, it hasn't been in the uh, uh, commercial quality wines, it hasn't even been in the center of the market. <clears throat> it has persistently migrated up and up and up to the over 20 and over $25. And so this makes you think, well, man, maybe people really will. Maybe we, people really will pay a higher price and we'll be able to pass through uh, the higher price to them. And that might be true, especially at the, uh, at the very highest segments. But, but you know, I, uh, uh, I have my doubts. Uh, and so this is where uh, I earn my label as an economist. They, they call econ economics the dismal science. That premiumization, for example, uh, people paying, moving to higher price points in the market. Well, for the most part, so here I exclude basically uh, rosé, and New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, for the most part, 
It isn't that people have been willing to pay more for the same wines, that is higher, higher prices for the same wines. They've mainly been upgrading to different wines. So they're willing to pay more, but for what they think will be to get more. Uh, this is part of the ex explanation of the enormous proliferation of wine brands in the United States and around the world. As uh, people uh, create new products at a slightly higher price point to be able to move up in the premiumization ladder uh, for this. And so uh, does premiumization uh, prove the case that we'll be able to raise wine prices as much as we'd like? When the answer I think is no, the question's still out. It's I still have my doubts. Well, then what about the pandemic wine sales? What about the fact that the only real substantial growth rate is in the smallest segment of the wine market, the, the market for ultra premium wines, $20, $25 and more. And this has only gotten um, uh, worse over the period of time. Well, doesn't that prove that people will be willing to pay more? Well, maybe they'll be willing to pay more for ultra premium wine. But um, as I wrote about on the Wine Economist um, um, last year, uh, that movement to the higher market, it was at the same time when bars and restaurants were closing down. And so I, I argued on the Wine Economist website that some of that movement to the ultra premium, at least some of it, was actually trading down. That instead of spending $75 at a restaurant for a bottle of wine, people were staying home, ordering the food in, and buying maybe a $35 bottle of wine, maybe the exact same bottle of wine actually, uh, for $35 or less at retail. And uh, certainly during this uh, period of time here at the Wine Economist household, we have bought some very nice, um, more expensive wines than we have bought in the past, but often they were um, direct to consumer and deeply discounted to us. So were we paying more or were we paying less? Uh, does it prove that we're willing to pay more or are we still pretty sensitive to price? Well, this is a question that we'll explore um, in 2022, one that will be, uh, um, that we will, we will have to find out more about through experience. Uh, my intuition, this is not a prediction, it's just intuition, is that um, below $20, it's gonna be pretty hard to raise price uh, because, um, because it seems to me there is such strong competition. If you raise price, you have a dozen competitors who are not so willing to raise price. Uh, maybe things are different above $20 or above $25. But my friends who live in that space tell me that the competition is even more intense up there. And so um, I'm cautious about the ability to raise price. Um, I think that price increases are likely to be limited, uh, likely to be limited in direct to consumer sales. I think that probably um, with only a few category exceptions that probably retailers and restaurants will be likely to be uh, um, cautious about raising price. I think the restaurants will maybe go the other direction entirely. And so what are you gonna do? You got these cost increases, pushing prices up, uh, and you've got, um, uh, you've got resistance to rising price. Uh, you get a, a big squeeze again. So what are you gonna do? Well, of course, one of the things I think is that if you look around, look around what other people are doing. There's just all sorts of things going on. People are trying so many different uh, effective strategies. Uh, for example, growers, well, uh, there's been a long-term movement toward more mechanization in the vineyard. And of course, this is only going to increase it. I don't think that anybody um, is, I don't think any bank is financing a vineyard now, vineyard planning or replanting that it, uh, cannot be uh, maintained and harvested uh, uh, mechanically than ever before. Uh, one thing you'll notice if you look around, um, look around in the wine aisle a little bit, uh, you'll see that um, some of those uh, North Coast Appalachian wines are now California Appalachian wines that uh, the producers are dealing with the big squeeze by sourcing Lodi fruit 
and instead of uh, coastal fruit or maybe Central Valley fruit um, for this, the Central Valley growers are, are, uh, are, are finding big demand for their grapes these days. Um, you'll also, if you look around, you might see that some of the, um, some labels that have always had a vintage date don't really have a vintage date. Uh, in the last year or so. And that's because there's been some uh, uh, multi-vintage blending going on. Uh, and some of it with enough of other vintages so that they have to obey the rules and, and not put a vintage date on it at all. And so um, this is another way to try to reduce the cost by blending in some older vintages of wine that are uh, in stock uh, available for a lower price. Uh, I wrote on the Wine Economist last fall uh, looking for lessons from the beer aisle. What's beer doing? Because um, beer is suffering from some of these same forces as well. And I found a great rabble bank study of how the beer industry uh, is uh, dealing with uh, uh, um, stagnant markets and dealing with um, uh, with uh, the cost squeeze as well. And it is kind of interesting. In, in Europe, rabble bank said, it looks like there was this attempt to expand geographically to try to find other places in other countries where there is a growing market and the potential for rising uh, margins to go with that. And so it's been expansion uh, through the global industry. Um, for example, uh, fairly recently, uh, Heineken, the, the big Dutch producer has bought this Stell from South Africa and they got some wine assets in that, but they also got the big beer and especially cider assets in that. And they're thinking that that's part of their strategy to deal with stagnant markets and the big squeeze is to expand to where margins are and where growth is. Um, uh, the other strategy, which Rado Bank associated with the United States was to move into uh, other products that can be put in the beer aisle. Like I found that Paps Blue Ribbon is producing a hard, um, a hard espresso beverage. Now a hard black coffee or a, um, a cold brew coffee that's there. So they figured that they can, they can move items into the beer aisle and that hard coffee might have higher margins than the beer they're trying to sell. It's certainly a different it's a, it's a, it's, it is a different product, but it, it is in fact, a, it seems to me a case that it, I can see where it might have, a, might, might well have higher margins. We'll see how it works. But uh, now you're, you're not beer producers if you're watching this, uh, this report. So what does this mean for you? And you're not big beer producers like Heineken or Caps Blue Ribbon, but it does, uh, does suggest that maybe you should be thinking about geographically, thinking about, all right, where, are the highest margins in the different markets where I try to sell my products. Uh, maybe I should focus on those areas that have the best margins. Uh, a few years ago, I asked a friend who's a Washington state producer about China. And he said, China, Mike, don't think China, think Denver. He told me that he thought that if for the amount of money it would take to get his wines successfully launched into China, that he could, he could make a whole much, much more money getting those wines more firmly established in Denver and the Colorado market and so forth. Began to think, where are the margins? Where is my investment going to be? Um, in the same way, uh, thinking about uh, not the Pabst Blue Ribbon hard um, uh, coffee idea, but, but thinking about which of your products do have the best margins and maybe focusing a bit more on them. Uh, for that. So the beer aisle doesn't provide answers, but it might provide some inspiration to strategies. Um, then th think about lessons from the pandemic. Of course, one of the lessons on the pandemic was um, direct to consumer sales. And uh, people who were, took advantage of that, some of them are, are, were able to actually do better than they did uh, before the pandemic, because they just had such loyalty among a consumer base and they were able to work their, um, their list so well to do this. And so uh, maybe to evaluate carefully how your direct-to-consumer margins are holding up and looking at the different uh, sales channels and, and investing the most in the areas and the sales channels where the margins are the very best. Um, giving that some real critical thought. My OG strategy uh, is to 
pick up the phone, darn it. The, um, you would be surprised how many name brand um, California wineries, wineries with really good reputations. You'd be surprised how many of those have used telephone sales as a very effective part of their marketing strategy. If you've got a wine club, you know what people have been buying. You probably know their birthdays. Um, you would be surprised in this age of impersonal apps and um, instant messaging. You would be surprised what happens when you make 100 phone calls and how much wine you might be willing to sell. You have to have people hang up on you a lot, right? Like, uh, but, but you would be amazed how it would go. Uh, rethinking the business model. Um, uh, a lot of people built their business model around what they could sell and where at what margins in the past time, time to rethink, time to think about uh, where the margins are today, time to think about um, where uh, the higher prices can be, those areas that can effectively be um, uh, trimmed in terms of costs and so forth. Now, the most important lesson is kind of a lesson we've learned from the whole pandemic, which is that uh, there's been big changes and what we're seeing isn't completely new. And in fact, in terms of the big squeeze, as growers know, there's nothing really new about it. What really has happened is that the long-term trends we face have been magnified and accelerated. And they have pushed us to make more changes faster than we ever would have. Um, like this Zoom conference, it always made sense to do this, but now we do it and we learn to do it better and better. And that's the, the bottom line on all of this. The, we're in the situation we're in. Uh, we've been coming to this for a long time. The big squeeze is there. Uh, it's time to think critically about how to approach it and move ahead. Well, George, that's my report. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Very much appreciate you uh, taking some time to be with us today. Of course, I want to thank everyone in the audience for, um, for joining us today and, and watching this session. And just remind you that our next session is coming up, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. We're going to talk a little bit about succession planning, whether you're passing your winery on to the next generation or just preparing it for sale. So it's going to be a really interesting conversation. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.